Back in 1992, China only produced 1 million cars. That sounds like a lot until you consider that Americans purchased over 13 million cars in that same year. So it's curious that Michael Dunn, who was majoring in French at the University of Michigan at the time, would suddenly decide to move to China to start an automotive advisory firm. But his gamble paid off. China's auto industry is now the largest in the world and produced 25 million cars this year, twice as many as were produced in the United States. Michael ended up spending over two decades living and working in China and Southeast Asia and is now the CEO of Zozo Go, a consulting firm focused on the electric car industry based out of San Diego, California. From the USC US China Institute, this is China Life, the podcast sharing the stories of people living and working in China. I'm your host, Craig Steuben. Growing up in Michigan, sort of, you know, the center of the car universe, were you immediately just fascinated with cars as a kid? Yes, in particular because my father, Jim Dunn, was the inventor of an art called car spy photography. So as a kid, I would accompany him on these hunts around the Detroit area where he would look for, if you've seen on the roads, camouflaged cars and take photos of them. And these are cars that were going to be introduced two, three, four years out. But he made no. a name for himself by capturing these cars on film starting way back in the 60s and 70s. And as a young kid and even as a teenager, I eventually became his wingman. Uh, the driver. Uh, and as he shot the photos, I drove the getaway car. And so there's a couple things going on there. One was I got to know cars really well firsthand. We test drove so many different kinds of cars. But more importantly, I got the feeling of what it's like to be on the front lines doing reconnaissance, being in the hunt, looking for something new, something different, the frontier. And that was really really made an impression on me. Like there's a big world out there. There's lots to discover and uncover. And I'm right in the middle of the action with my dad doing this in the car industry. Despite that, when you went to the University of Michigan, you majored in French. Was that kind of off the beaten path, right? Well, it it definitely sounds like it now as we look in retrospect. But at the time, my parents were interested in us traveling. We took uh, seven kids. They'd take coast to coast in motorhomes as a kid. And then as teenagers, we all went to Europe. And the culture of the family was go and explore, see firsthand, learn for yourself. And so um, part of that was we all were encouraged to study a second language. And well, French was it when I was going to school. You learned French or Spanish, and I flipped a coin, it landed on French. In my junior year, I was in Nexo-Provence, and my professor there said, hey, you sound like a guy who likes to focus on the future. We we'll all love France, but France is not the future. The future is in Asia, and it's probably China. So I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back my senior year, and I'm going to learn Chinese. Why not? And um, from almost the first day in class, I said, my goodness, this is what I've been looking for. I really love this language and I love the history associated with it. And it just took me by storm. So I made a major pivot about to graduate and shifted to studying Chinese uh, through the, my senior year. I stayed the summer after my senior year to take, senior, uh, to take uh, intensive Chinese, stayed the following year to take third and fourth year of Chinese before in 1986 going to China for the first time. Did you know anything about China at the time? Less than zero. <laughs> but there were headlines in the paper about, you know, in the late 70s, there was this thing called normalization. And the University of Michigan happened to have a pretty prestigious, highly respected uh, China center. But it wasn't long before I thought, wow, I've stumbled upon something phenomenal here. This country is about to open up. It's the frontier of our lifetimes. No one I know has been there. I can be a trail. I can be out there, the intrepid. And, and discover something that no one else knows about. That, that was really the appeal, the draw. So I guess you learning about China in your like master's program, did you feel like you knew different, you knew better, and you were going to do things the Michael Dunn way, and it was going to be different? That's exactly the sentiment. And, and how inspiring. Oh, I, I know how to speak the language. We're in modern times. 
China wants to, and this is important, China seems to want to embrace the West. Now, in retrospect, I think China wanted to catch up, but on its own terms. And there's a massive difference between the two. So uh, like those before me, I bought into the whole image of, hey, no one's really conquered, been able to effect change in China. I could be the first. I could be one of the first to really, really have an impact on this massive country with its long history. How do your impressions of China changed? Like, what did you know about the country now that, you know, you hadn't just a few years before? It was not until I got into China proper that I began to understand the realities of and the complexity of China. So for those of us who have studied Chinese, Chinese history, Chinese language, there is a tendency in the United States, I'd say, to paint a beautiful picture of China at its very best. You know, almost Tang Song dynasty eras of culture and temples and poetry and music and just a really, really attractive social picture, picture of society. Then when I arrived in China for the first time, still a graduate student, I went directly to Chongqing, which is a he- was a heavy industry. The air was filled with pollution, crowded, noisy, tough place where everyone was sort of surviving. I said, I, this couldn't be further away from what my expectations were. How do I reconcile this? Wait, hang on. This is not the China that I was read about and taught about in the great textbooks. This is a different China. So it was a real wake up call for me. And it was like, okay, which one is the real China? At what point did you realize you weren't going to be able to change the whole country yourself? For, for one of the first impressions anybody gets stepping into China is the sheer, it, the sheer humanity. I mean, you arrive at the airport and there are layers and layers of people holding signs and, and noise and chaos and, and bodies everywhere. And it's overwhelming. It, you say, oh, my goodness, there's an ocean of people before me. And I'm just one little minnow in this ocean. <laughs> and so that first impression really hit home. Oh, OK, maybe this won't be so simple after all. That was that was the first first thing. Did you ever think like I've made a huge mistake? No question. There were days of doubt. And what am I doing here? My family would visit and they sort of would look at me and say, are you sure you know what you're doing? Keep in mind, incomes at that time, 1986. No one had any money. So when you landed in China for the first time, what was your plan? How were you going to make money? How were you going to survive? <laughs> it's so tempting in retrospect to say I had this splendid plan all mapped out. <laughs> the truth was I, I knew that I really enjoyed learning the language. And I liked being in an environment with a lot of uncertainty and things up in the air and possibility. And uh, that, those two were enough to, to take me to China. And then I said, okay, I've got to make some, a living. How do I make, <laughs> make some income? I, I, hey, wait a second. I, I know something about cars, grew up around them. And as incomes rise in this country, I got to believe that people are going to start buying cars. And when they do, automakers from all over the world will converge here. And when they step inside, they'll be completely baffled by this place different language, different culture, different uh, values, different priorities. How will they be able to adjust? And with that in mind, I set up my first company in 1990 called Automotive Resources Asia, working with global automakers and their suppliers to step into China and avoid the landmines, try to get into business without making too many mistakes. What did the uh, streets look like in 1990? Very few cars. You had bicycles. But I remember my very first day in China, I landed at the airport in Chengdu. You know, you always remember your first impression of a, of a new country. And stepping off the plane and into the airport, what I remembered was it was quiet. Now, you would never believe that if you went to China today. But things were moving very slowly. It was quiet. There were bicycles on the street. Very few motorized vehicles, the occasional truck, some buses, 
but by and large, the streets belonged to pedestrians and to bicycles. That was it. I guess, how long were you trying to figure out this auto industry that hadn't really developed yet before you know you got your first lead? That took a while. I was there for a full six months. And I remember it was a Christmas Eve that I decided to call home. And I explained the situation to my dad. And he goes, I know you'll work it out. And he hung up the phone. As life happens, totally unexpected and out of the blue, I got a call just a few weeks later from the head of Chrysler China. And they had a very special situation. Beijing Jeep, joint venture between Chrysler and the city of Beijing, had as part of their joint venture agreement that Chrysler would export a certain number of Jeeps somewhere outside of China to earn foreign exchange, foreign currency, which was extremely important at that time. Trouble was the Jeeps being made in Beijing were welcome nowhere. No country in the world wanted these uh, sketchily put together, iffy Jeeps uh, made in Beijing by the state enterprise where people taking naps every other hour. So long story short, the United Nations Cambodia needed transportation. I helped to broker that deal. And after that, I became a mini hero in the eyes of the Christ. So, oh, we were really in a jam. This guy's resourceful. He can help us out. And then we started to build a business with Chrysler. And then Chrysler talked to the people at Ford and said, there's this guy in Asia. Have you heard about him? He's got a company called. And that's how things got started. I imagine that the the business you were learning in the University of Michigan is very different than how things operate in China. Totally different. And I remember one of the first weeks after forming the company and setting up the office in Beijing, my number one uh, staffer, Sophia, said, um, okay, it's Monday. Our first, our plan for this week, the first thing we need to do is visit the government agencies that are responsible for the auto industry. We should also visit the people at the tax bureau and probably a good idea to pay a visit to the fire station down the block too, the fire fire department. <laughs> okay, okay, what planet am I on, Sophia? These have nothing to do with business. We need to find our clients and deliver services. I don't have time to see the government. And she said, no, no, you, you don't understand. The government is our market. Once we solve that market, then we can go and take care of our customers. So I, this was complete lunacy to me, like a different language. What? And so I went along half-heartedly just to say, all right, uh, I understand I went in Rome, do as the Romans, but didn't really buy into it. Over time, I came to understand, and this is an important learning for anybody doing business in China. There are two markets. You've got to establish relationships with the officials who are in your industry. It's a relationship wherein you want them to know that you're there and who you are so that later, if anything comes up, they go, yeah, yeah, I, I've met that company. I know about them. They're okay. That's really uh, sounds probably for Western ears a little bit unusual and strange, but it's part and parcel of uh, winning in China. Do you remember what that first meeting was like? I do. Um, the very first meeting was with the tax department. And the meeting didn't take place at the tax office. No, no, we don't meet them at the tax office. We meet them at the restaurant. And um, okay, we meet them at the what restaurant? Well, the tax official said her favorite restaurant was a seafood restaurant just up the block here, not too far away. So okay, seafood restaurant. And do we have an agenda for the meeting? No, 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 there's no agenda for the meeting. We're, we're, we're going to eat together. And she's probably going to eat a lot and probably going to take away a lot for her family and her friends. Okay, but when do we talk business? Like, what do we need to get done with the tax department? And um, my colleague said, just eat. <laughs> so I'm looking for some deliverables. All right, we're going to eat. And then do we get a document? Uh, we, do we sign up for something? Are we in good standing? And they patiently looked at me and said, we're going to eat with her. That's all. Trust it. It's going to be fine. So that's my first lesson in how you start to build. Go eat. Go eat. 
the entire lunch, not a single word was spoken about our company, about tax policy, about business at all. It was just enjoying a good meal together. Done. Uh, do you feel like what you learned about business in your uh, master's program prepared you for China? Or do you think you just kind of had to learn as you go? <laughs> there was a two parts to the program. So there's the business side. And then, of course, there's a master's in Chinese history. The, the master in Chinese history definitely helped prepare me for uh, Chinese culture and getting, especially in the language. Once you're, you have a window into how people are thinking, once you know the language. So that was enormously helpful. On the business side, uh, there, there's, there's some business wisdom that is universal. So I would recall things that I learned from the business class, but keep in mind, you know, Michigan MBA in 1990, that's all about getting people ready for the, to work for GM, Ford and Chrysler. End of story. So it's just kind of funny that it was really learning Chinese history and Chinese language that prepared you more for being able to do business than actual business school. Exactly. And, and the argument could still be made today. I would say it's still true. If you ask me, do you want to have a one year education in Chinese, Chinese history, Chinese language, or do you want a one year in business? Your, your job is going to be to go to start a company in China, I take the, the Chinese training for sure and, and, and learn the business um, as I go. So when you came back to the U.S. three years ago, did you kind of have to readjust how to do business now doing it in the U.S.? Definitely. Definitely. That's, uh, that's been a, arguably a tougher adjustment because I didn't expect to need to adjust, but but I was in Asia for so long that I got accustomed to Asian ways. And specifically, um, in the U.S., things move very fast. And they're, you know, for lack of a better word, I think it's a transaction-oriented society. And business is definitely transaction first. Get the job, get the business done. And then, oh, by the way, how's your family and everything else? So I had grown accustomed to the Asian way where you get to know someone first connect on a personal level, and then ease into business. Um, they couldn't be more different. Are there things you learned doing business in China that helps you now back in the U.S.? I think uh, that's always tough to measure, but I got to believe, I have to believe that uh, I learned things from the Chinese for sure. One is that they, they say that a personal relationship still matters a lot. I find that a big part of my work here is establishing those good, solid, trusting relationships. And without that time in, in Asia, I don't know that I, I would have arrived there. But do you think that there's anything specific how you changed being in China than coming back? Did you come back to the US three years ago different? than the way you went there because of China? Mm. My time in Asia, most of my adult life was spent there. Definitely shaped me. How? How has it shaped me? Um, probably patience. <laughs> I'm a hard-charging MBA from Michigan, ready to get things done. Let's go. Patience is such a, what in American culture is kind of a flimsy, not a strength. <laughs> or, or it's like, oh, you have to be patient? Bullshit. I don't want to be patient. I'm in it. I want to get things done. So it's almost the antithesis of our culture. And when you say, hey, when you step into Asia, it's really important to be patient. Someone could easily interpret that as, oh, this guy's gone native. He lost his roots. He doesn't know what's going on. What do you mean be patient? Why? What for? Let's move. America's a very young country. We do things very quick. And, you know, we don't have that kind of cultural history to kind of like give us a longer perspective on things. Right. Right. That's really gets to the heart of the matter. I, I'm reminded as you speak about a meeting just a couple months ago with one of our clients, American company and a Chinese company, tech company, and not long into the meeting, the American side was disenchanted. Just said, mm, I don't think this meeting is going to go the way we want it to go. And, they kind of hinted, okay, let's, uh, you know, we're going to wrap this up. 
kind of turned to me and go, let's just wrap this up. And I said, I kind of gave him a look like we don't want to wrap this up right now. I know it's not good, but don't, don't, don't do something abrupt. It's not going to pay well later. <laughs> it's not going to pay, pay, pay off later. Be patient, see it through. And you never know this actually what happened. The meeting pivoted and it got a lot better. I didn't know that that would happen, but my younger self would have said, yeah, I agree. Let's just get out of here. But um, somehow in Asia, you want to hang around, be respectful, and it, and it pays off later. If you were to go back in time and give one piece of advice to yourself in 1986, what would that be? Uh, get ready for a, a marathon, not a sprint. Take your time to build relationships with people. It's like planting seeds and those relationships will, will, will grow and blossom and later on they'll bear a lot of fruit. Don't be in a hurry to make an impact right away. It won't work. Um, be methodical, be patient, be persevering and things will come, come your way. That's the Asian rhythm. That's the Asian rhythm. That's how things work. China Life is a production of the USC US China Institute. If you haven't yet, subscribe to China Life wherever you listen to podcasts to get all of our shows downloaded onto your listening device automatically. While you're there, leave us a review. It really helps other people find out about the show. To learn more about the USC US China Institute and browse our vast collection of resources, such as historical and contemporary documents, China based events around the US, author interviews, seminars for educators, and much more, visit our website at china.usc.edu. I'm Craig Steubing, and this is China Life.